Tony Blair is the longest serving Labour Prime Minister in British history. Alistair Campbell was for 10 years his closest confidant, friend and political ally. Campbell was the other man in the room. He attracted more attention than he wanted and caused more controversy than he planned. He wrote it all down, the good times and bad, in his personal diaries. They've been secret till now, but Tony Blair's departure from number 10 frees Campbell to reveal the inside story on his years with Blair, the obsessions and the rows, the ups and downs of political life. Tony said, I've been reckless and foolish and paid a price. So has Cherie, who had a terrible shock. I wept because of the pressures I was under and the sadness I felt for Kelly's family. Tony said, in truth, I've never really wanted to do more than two full terms. I did actually wonder whether what I discovered on reading my own diary would be so awful I would want to top myself. It's six o'clock on Tuesday the 11th of September. Good morning, this is Today with Sue McGregor and James Doherty. The headlines this morning, Tony Blair will address the TUC conference today and try to reassure union leaders over his plans for greater private sector involvement in schools and hospitals. The court in Melbourne has... I woke up with the usual blar on the radio about Tony and the TUC speech. All the old BBC clichés about us and the unions. We finished Tony's speech on the train were met and driven to the hotel. We were there, up at the top of the hotel, putting the finishing touches to the speech when the attacks on the New York Twin Towers began. It was now even clearer than just a few moments ago just how massive an event this was. It's possible we were talking about thousands dead. It's got to be a, a terrorist attack. I can't tell you anything more than that. I saw the plane hit the building. Move it! Come on! We would have to make immediate judgments about buildings and institutions to protect here. Tony was straight on to the diplomatic side as well. Said that we had to help the US, that they could not go it all on their own. There was always a moment in these terrorist outrages where governments said we must not let the terrorists change what we do. It was meaningless. Of course they changed what we did. At first we felt it best to go ahead with the speech, but by the time we were leaving for the venue, the towers were actually collapsing. We went over to the conference centre, where Tony broke the news to John Monks that he intended to go on, say a few words, but then we would have to head back to London. Monks said to me, it's on days like this that you realise just how big his job is. Tony's mind was whirring with it. I know that you would want to join with me in sending the deepest condolences to President Bush and to the American people on behalf of the British people at these terrible events. We set off for Brighton Station. Tony said the consequences of this were enormous. He asked for a pad and started to write down some of the issues we would have to address when we got back. He said the big fear was terrorists capable of this getting in league with rogue states that would help them. He'd been going on about bin Laden for a while because there had been so much intelligence about him and Al-Qaeda. He made a note of the need to reach out to the British Muslim community who would fear a backlash if this was bin Laden. Everyone seemed convinced it couldn't be anyone else. As New York struggled to cope, to adapt to the clogging dust 
the fallout of so much tragedy. More news was coming in, a fourth crashed airliner in Pittsburgh. And somehow, American government seemed almost powerless amidst all this. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. And freedom will be defended. The United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. As smoke blew across Capitol Hill, the heart of American democracy, it is clear that this is the biggest attack on America since Pearl Harbor. Once back at number 10, Blair is briefed by the chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee, John Scarlett, and his colleagues about the background to the attacks. Tony's immediate concern was that Bush would be put under enormous pressure to do something irresponsible. If America heard the worldview develop that this happened because Bush was more isolationist, there would be a reaction. This is not a battle between the United States of America and terrorism, but between the free and democratic world and terrorism. He'd been reading the Quran over the summer. Muhammad had lost battles, but there was a belief that if you died in the cause you believed in, then you went straight to heaven. That was a very, very powerful thing to work against. Bush and Blair speak on the telephone for the first time the day after the attacks. The president confirmed he would not launch a counter-assault. Bush said the American people would give him a bit of time. He said this was a new war. These people had to come out of their hole sometime. We, uh, our country will, however, not be cowed by terrorists, by people who don't share the same values we share. God bless you, Mr. Hassan. Appreciate you. I felt Bush was almost zen-like, almost too calm. Maybe he had decided he could wait longer than we thought. Tony said we had to think of a way of getting to the U.S. for a face-to-face -face meeting. He said he needed to see him in a room and look in his eyes and not do all this on a phone with 15 people listening in. Tony Blair came to the magnificent Church of St. Thomas's on New York's Fifth Avenue to remember the British dead and missing, their precise number still unknown. Mr. Blair said it's a tragedy that's made the bonds of solidarity between Britain and America stronger than ever. Your loss we count as our loss. Your struggle we take as our struggle. And I think the spirit that's been showing here in your city is just something remarkable. And it's that spirit that should inspire us to do what we now need to do to see this thing through. Blair went on to Washington for dinner at the White House and took Bush to one side for a private talk. They clearly embarked straight away on a very tough conversation. Tony emphasized the need for a measured response and that we needed to keep public opinion with us at all times. Bush said yes, but when I'm speaking tough, I'm speaking to middle America, most of whom have never heard of bin Laden until now. They just know someone attacked their country and killed their fellow citizens. And they say, hey, Mr. President, go get someone, and why ain't you done it the day before yesterday? Bush paid Blair the ultimate presidential compliment, making him guest of honor at Congress. I was worried about it because it would play into the whole poodle thing. John Kerr called to say it would be ghastly that the whole thing would become an orgy of American patriotism with Tony in a kind of nod-along role. America has no truer friend than Great Britain. Once again, we are joined together in a great cause. So honored the British Prime Minister has crossed an ocean to show his unity with America. Thank you for coming, friend.